Good morning, I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, the votes are in. Ballots still being counted this morning, but already we're seeing huge outcomes. One of the most watched races ending in defeat for Democrats. Republican newcomer Glenn Youngkin waking up as Virginia's governor-elect, beating former Governor Terry McAuliffe in a state handily won by President Biden just last year. And in New Jersey, an unexpected nail biter with the race for governor still too close to call between Democratic incumbent Phil Murphy and Republican challenger Jack Cittarelli. We have team coverage with the latest results from the most critical races and what it all means as we look ahead to next year's midterm elections. Also this morning, a game changer in the fight against the coronavirus. 28 million children are now eligible for the vaccine after the CDC gives the okay to Pfizer shot for kids as young as five. We'll check in with a doctor for what parents need to know. Concealed carry controversy, the fight over gun rights in New York, now set to go before the nation's highest court. The case that's raising questions about public safety and self-defense. And buy now, pay later. Major retailers now offering an attractive alternative to paying up front and in full. But is there a catch? We look into the fine print, what you need to know to help you with your holiday shopping. Good morning to you. We are waking up with a lot of news. Yeah, some people might have had a late night last night yeah, watching the I results. did, too yeah. late. <laughs> Who cannot stay up for Kornacki? Exactly. But we're waking up with winners in the politics world, the sports world. We've got vaccine news. It's a big morning, and we're going to get to it all and cover it all for you. Let's get started with Election Day results, of course, still coming in at this hour. So here's where some of the key races stand right now. First and foremost, NBC News projects that Republican Glenn Youngkin will be the next governor of Virginia. After upsetting Democrat Terry McAuliffe in a hard-fought contest, Youngkin winning in a state easily won by President Biden last year, uh, shaking up the picture for both parties heading into next year's midterms. In New Jersey, the only other race for governor, that one remains too close to call, really close to call. New York City and Boston both have chosen their new mayors. We're covering it all this morning with NBC News correspondents Heidi Prisbella and Rahema Ellis, along with NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. Let's start with Heidi. She joins us from Alexandria, Virginia. Heidi, good morning. So to many, the Virginia's governor's race was the big prize this election cycle. Former Governor Terry McAuliffe started out with a strong lead in this campaign, but that's not how it ended up. Glenn Youngkin narrowly edging him out. What do we know about the voter turnout and how did that impact the outcome here? Yeah, good morning, Joe. The Democrats' hypothesis really broke last night. The hypothesis was that if you just get a huge turnout in this state, which has more Biden voters, then Terry McAuliffe wins. Well, we had record-smashing turnout, and Glenn Youngkin won. And here's how he did it. He held Trump's margins in a lot of these rural Trump counties in the West and Southwest, but he also built on Trump's margins or cut into the Democrats' uh, advantage in the suburbs particularly Loudoun County, where you had a lot of those controversies over schools. Uh, there was also lower African-American turnout. So you combine all of those things, and that is how Youngkin pulled it out. So for all of the prognostications over the past four years, Joe, about this state really being more blue than purple, nah, it's still purple. Heidi, Youngkin, a Republican, did not tie himself closely to former President Donald Trump. He struck this delicate balancing act with Trump. He, he didn't campaign with him, but he was still able to get Trump voters to turn out for him. He also ran on some key issues. Tell us about the campaign he ran and what issues made the difference here. Well, look, it's always, if you look at the exit polls, the economy always is number one. So that, that's what we saw here in the end, the economy and jobs, uh, maybe the sense that COVID was holding the economy back, inflation worries, higher gas prices. Um, but here was the real issue that made the difference. And you talked to voters out on the street was, and in these polls, which is education. How did that happen? Well, first of all, a lot of these heated school board meetings that we saw all across the state had to do with COVID protocols and Republican parents feeling that maybe there was too much uh, in, in the way of restrictions there. And then this issue that Glenn Youngkin really pushed, this, this notion that critical race theory is being taught in schools, even though it was hard to find specific examples of the curriculum that would have qualified as that in our discussions with voters. And then finally, there was a searing ad 
uh, that Glenn Youngkin used on education and what Terry McAuliffe said about the role of parents in education that we found to be um, very effective when we talked to voters. Uh, Youngkin clearly zeroed in on local politics, but do we know how much national politics influenced this election? You know, anecdotally, we, we didn't hear a lot of Republican voters saying this is a referendum vote on Biden. It was mostly local issues. It was mostly this education issue, the issue of the critical race theory and and Republican parents being very upset about what's going on at schools. But at the same time, if you look at Biden's disapproval ratings in this state, it's about 54 percent. So there's no way that that was helping Terry McAuliffe. So what we saw here really was uh, all of these issues, all of this confluence of, of voters, uh, Republicans coming home, the moderate women maybe not being as angry and marching to the polls to cast their referendum vote against President Trump. Um, and all of these things kind of playing a big role. And, and just finally, you know, there's history. Terry McAuliffe was really going against the grain here, thinking that he could win a second term. There's only been no governor has done that since 1851 here. We have term limits of four years. So he would have really uh, broken a historical record there if he had pulled this out, guys. A lot of things at play in this election. Heidi, thanks so much. To New Jersey now, where votes are still being counted, and we wait for a winner to be declared in that state's governor's race. Here's where things stand right now. Democratic incumbent Governor Phil Murphy is fighting to keep the office. Take a look at that number, bottom of your screen, right in the middle. That's the margin between these two. Look at how close that is. Former State Assembly member Jack Cittarelli, who you see there on the left of your screen, has surpassed expectations in another state that President Biden won handily last year. This morning, as you can see, this race is still too close to call. NBC News correspondent Rahima Ellis is in Hoboken, New Jersey. Rahima, good morning. So let's start right there where this stands. Too close to call a winner. Vote is still coming in and still being counted. We see how small that margin is. How are things looking right now? Well, it's as you point out, this is a nail biter here in New Jersey. And one of the things that people are looking at is how these candidates were uh, Coming to the voters, we talked to a voter a man who was on his way uh, to work, and he said he voted for Murphy, but he thought Citarelli ran a better campaign. We were talking about that they saw more signs for him. So he was he was making his presence known here in this second attempt for him to win the seat of the governor's office here in this state. And he was also running in favor of a lot of people who have expressed enormous uh, frustration with the economy and with the high taxes. You know the taxes, the property taxes here in New Jersey are the highest of any state in the, in the country. In addition, while COVID was an issue for 20 months, it's not the biggest issue that people are thinking about. As I say, it's the economy. And some people are also mad about the fact that they, the vaccine and the mandates were something that Governor Murphy was insisting on. There are a lot of people who were just frustrated and angry with that. And Citarilla was in their corner saying if he becomes governor, he's going to turn the tide away from that. That resonated with people. And as you can see, it's showing up in the polls right now, Savannah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's talk through each of these candidates' messages, each of their campaigns. So we'll start... Rahama with Jack Chitterelli, he did much better than the polls projected. And again, I mean, this was a state that President Biden won handily just a year ago. He has not declared victory, though. What was his closing message to viewers, what did, to voters, excuse me, what did he campaign on? One of the things that he was doing is saying that he is going to represent people here in the state of New Jersey. It is a common message you'll hear from politicians. But he was talking even last night as he addressed his supporters, saying he never called in outside celebrities or big political names to campaign for him. He was doing it by going door to door, diner to diner, facing the voters themselves and talking about what he would do with them. And I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was also listening to what the frustration and anger is. People know Christmas is coming. Hanukkah is coming. They're not happy that their Christmas presents are on some ship on a tanker out in the ocean. And he seemed to be listening to that intently. Savannah? And now let's talk about the other side of this. If current Governor Murphy does pull this one out and wins re-election, first of all, I mean, he'd be the become the first Democratic incumbent to win re-election since 1977. Tell us about his campaign and where did it seem to work in the state? Well, one of the things that he was doing is he was saying, if you like the way things have been going in the state in terms of COVID with education, 
don't change. Don't change course. Don't take a detour. Stick with Murphy. And for some people, it seemed to work. Many people thought that it would work overwhelmingly because there are more than a million more registered Democrats in this state than there are registered Republicans. And maybe some people felt comfortable that they did not need to go to the polls. The word is that the turnout here was lighter than some people would have liked it. And it's to his detriment. When Murphy ran in 2017, he got 300,000 more votes. Didn't get that this time. Savannah? Graham, lots to watch for there. We will stay on it throughout the morning, especially with that slim margin. Thank you so much. Let's bring in NBC News senior political editor Mark Murray. So, Mark, big picture, what are the conclusions we can draw from these races as we look ahead to the midterms? And did Glenn Youngkin just give Republicans a 2022 playbook? Yeah, Joe, it, it sure looks like it. And again, you know, one of the tactics and strategy that we ended up seeing Terry McAuliffe try to do was campaign on Donald Trump and really tie Republican Glenn Youngkin to Donald Trump. And when you end up looking at the exit poll, Donald Trump remains unpopular in Virginia. Just 42 percent end up uh, uh, having a favorable view of him versus 54 percent unfavorable. That's really similar to the vote margin we ended up seeing in the 2020 presidential race. So Donald Trump is still unpopular. But when we also look at some of the other exit polls, we ended up seeing that 17 percent of voters who ended up uh, having an unfavorable opinion of Donald Trump voted for Glenn Youngkin. And so we, uh, that, along with Glenn Youngkin's performance with independent voters, just a Trump message was not good enough for the Democrats and for Terry McAuliffe. So, Mark, let's dig in on that. I mean, if that is the case there, that exit polls show this majority of Virginia voters disapproving of President Trump, but then the state still flips red in this governor's race, what does it say about his influence now? Also, what does it say about McAuliffe election strategy to make this another referendum on the former president, despite the fact that we did not see his opponent campaign with him much? At all, yeah, really. Savannah, I think that this is more was more a referendum on Joe Biden and Democrats than Donald Trump. And of course, this is in a lot of ways kind of an inverse of what we ended up seeing in uh, the 2017 races for New Jersey governor and Virginia governor, where an unpopular Donald Trump ended up dragging down his party and leading to big movement and gains for Democrats in Virginia that they won by nine points in 2017 and by 14 points uh, in New Jersey. And so all of a sudden, you end up having a Joe Biden who is unpopular, according uh, to the exit poll we saw in Virginia. Just 45 percent of voters uh, approved of the, uh, the current president's job. And it really does look like the overall environment right mm -hmm. now that has been unfavorable to Democrats turned out to be really decisive in both of these contests. Mark, Virginia has been more of a purple state, especially when it comes to governors known to go back and forth between red and blue, depending on which party wins the White House. What does this projected Republican victory tell us about voter attitudes right now when it comes nationally to Democrats having control in Washington and when it comes to President Biden? Yeah. And so, Joe, what we're actually seeing is there are two big storylines in Virginia and as in New Jersey, as we continue to count the votes. And that is, number one, uh, you know, in in, New, in uh, Virginia, you end up having a situation where the Republican base really just was turned out, that uh, Glenn Youngkin did super well in rural areas. And in, for, Terry McAuliffe was unable to, uh, unable to uh, really bring out a lot of African-American voters. And so supercharged Republican turnout, less than enthusiastic or less than presidential level turnout for Democrats. And you have a situation where uh, Virginia and New Jersey continue to look like the, they've always played that year after a presidential election, where they become much more difficult for the party and control of the White House. Enthusiasm is key. All right, Mark, thanks so much. Well, of course, stay on the latest election results throughout the morning, but we do want to move on to other major news this morning. More than 28 million children are now eligible to get the coronavirus vaccine. Overnight, CDC Director Rochelle Walensky signed off on the Pfizer vaccine for kids 5 to 11 years old just hours after a CDC panel recommended the two-dose vaccine. Doses of the kids' vaccine have already arrived at hospitals and pharmacies across the country with more on the way. Pfizer is now speeding up distribution, saying they will have 11 million doses out the door over the next 10 days. 
Several of those doses are actually already at Children's National Hospital in D.C. That's where we find NBC News correspondent Cal Perry. Cal, good morning. Thanks for being up early for us. So in just a moment, I'll ask you about what's happening with these shots there where you are. But first, let's talk about the CDC's decision. What do parents waking up this morning need to know about the children's dose of this vaccine? Yes, yeah, certainly millions of parents have been waiting for this news. The morning is now. A lot of these kids are going to be seeing some jabs in the arms this morning. Just to run over some of the data for you, we can put up some of this, uh, some of the information, some of the stats. 91% effective in preventing COVID. This was in the trial data amongst children ages 5 to 11. Side effects including fatigue, headache, and chills. Though when you look at the data itself, Savannah, the, 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 the wide majority only saw sore arms. That was sort of the major side effect. PGX shot is about a third of the adult dose. That's 10 micro micrograms, not the usual 30 micrograms that both teenagers and adults are receiving. And the data showed no cases of myocarditis. That is swelling in the heart. That is what uh, people were worried about. That is not happening in children, certainly not in the data that we've seen. And that, as you said, brings now 28 million children into play who can get the vaccine as of this morning. It is the hope, of course, amongst medical officials that this will really stem the tide of those infections, not only in schools, but as well as community spread, especially as we approach the holidays, Savannah. Now, Cal, let's talk about how this rollout works. So despite Pfizer shipping out millions of doses already, as I mentioned, there are some at the hospital right behind you. The White House does say, though, the vaccine rollout for kids may not be fully up and running until next week. Why is that? And then what will that look like? Look, part of that is going to be the dosage, right? As a third of the normal dose, 10 micrograms, that has to be measured out. Then it has to be given out. We did see HHS working weeks ago with a lot of these hospitals, especially in rural parts of the country, to get that vaccine out there. The other options are going to be, as they have been for teenagers and for adults, pharmacies, but of course, the pediatrician. Pediatrician's office is where a lot of medical officials are sort of pointing families towards in the next coming weeks, sort of when people are looking to get that vaccine. And Cal, quickly there at Children's National, what's this rollout going to look like? I understand it's starting with more vulnerable children first this morning. Exactly. It's the most acute patients that will be started with first, as we saw with adults as well. Immunocompromised children will be getting it here this morning, which, of course, is good news and a relief to a lot of families, Savannah. Cal Perry, big news this morning. Thank you so much. For more on this, let's bring in Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton. She's the co-founder and medical director of Good Stock Consulting and a professor of anesthesiology and critical care medicine. So, Dr. Hilton, we know adults, older adults, have been impacted by the virus more than children. So how do you explain to hesitant parents that it is important to get their kids vaccinated? Right. You know, it is one of those things where, yes, adults tend to have worse outcomes, but we can't ignore the impact that COVID has had on our children. In fact, in September, it was the sixth leading cause of death for school-aged kids, the sixth leading cause. And it's one of those things where vaccines can help to prevent that. We just now stated that it was 91% effective against infections, and it's 95% effect, uh, effective against symptomatic COVID, that, that severe COVID that lands kids in the hospital. So you have to weigh the risk of the fact that COVID is still here. The fact that we're still burying one person every 55 seconds in America, and that we're going to go to colder weather where kids are going to be indoors, and it risks exposure to them. So vaccination is a way to protect. So, doctor, as kids start getting this shot, remind us, what are the vaccine side effects that parents and kids should be watching out for? Right. And it's similar. It's, it's a sore arm. It is that when, when we have these side effects, we call them side effects, but actually it is your immune system working. So what do you see? It's just like when you go to the gym and work out those muscles, right? You start to sweat, you start to get, you know, muscle aches. When we work out your immune system by giving you this vaccine, what causes are the side effects are the, the fevers. You may have fevers for an hour, a day or two. You may have muscle aches for a day or two. That is the, the way your body is showing you that, yes, my lymph nodes, my, my white blood cells, my body is starting to learn how to fight against COVID-19 should my child actually be infected while they're simply going to school. And we know those outbreaks are happening. All right. I know kids are just starting to maybe get shots now, but let's talk about boosters anyway. We know adults are already getting Pfizer boosters. Do you think children might need a third dose or another dose down the line, or is it just too early to really know? But it's too early to know, but I can only assume that that's going to be the case, right? We we know that there is not a single, we have one single vaccine that gets one dose. That's yellow fever. All other vaccines are either two or three dose series. And, and we know that sometimes four doses and, until you reach that true um, value of immunity. Um, so we can anticipate, I would assume that kids are going to follow along the same path um, that we are seeing with adults. But 
the great thing is, is when we are vaccinated, what we see is that we have a, a slowing of this virus attempt to infect the entire population. And I think one state that can show that is, is looking at Florida. We now hear these reports of, oh, Florida has the lowest COVID rate. Um, yeah, because of the fact that now they're 60% vaccinated. That's the power and the influence of what vaccines can do. All right, Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton, always good to have you on. Thank you so much. President Biden is back in Washington this morning after attending that U.N. climate conference in Scotland. The COP26 meeting continues until next Friday with world leaders working to deliver major action to curb climate change. Now, Biden promised major action, but back at home, his economic agenda, including climate change spending, is still facing pushback from some in his own party. Of course, we also have election results to get reaction on here. Joining us now is NBCNews.com senior White House reporter Shannon Pettypee. She's going to walk us through all this. Shannon, good morning. So let's start with COP26. Before returning to Washington, the president announced that 100 countries will adopt new environmental rules to slash methane emissions. Was he able to achieve everything he set out to get done in Scotland, and how was that announcement received? Well, you know, setting a big, ambitious goal like that and getting, as you mentioned, 100 countries on the same page, that was one of the big goals, one of the big efforts of this. Of course, now the hard work begins of actually implementing those policies, putting them into action, actually putting the money and investment into infrastructure and projects that will help reduce those emissions. So that's what comes next. You know, I would note one other thing that the president really set out to uh, achieve at this conference, though, was to establish the role of the U.S. as a leader back in the global community, particularly when it comes to climate change. And that was something the president said he felt he was able to accomplish. And he really tried to leverage the fact that China and Russia weren't at this meeting and that the U.S. instead was really the only global leader here that was working with other countries to tackle these big issues. Now, Shannon, as the president is making these promises, a major spending bill that includes funding to fight climate change, one that he hoped to have buttoned up before making this trip overseas, still hangs in the balance. How likely is it that Biden can turn these promises into action? Yeah, I mean, he comes back to Washington with a lot of work to do, and really we're in not much of a different place than he was when he left. Here's what the president had to say yesterday about whether he's optimistic he can get one of those uh, key senators that we need, uh, that the, the uh, Democrats need to get on board, Senator Joe Manchin. Here's what he had to say. I understand that Joe is looking for the precise detail to make sure nothing got slipped in in terms of the way in which the legislation got written that is different than he acknowledged he would agree to. But I, I think we'll get this done. And the president is back in Washington today. He does not have anything on his public schedule, got in really late last night, but White House officials have indicated they plan to jump right back into those talks and continue to push to try and get a deal done here. Shannon, before we let you go, we, of course, have to ask you about these election results that we're getting last night and this morning. How has the White House reacted to these results, especially these wins from Republicans? Well, we haven't gotten a chance to hear directly from the president on that. It, certainly, there was a lot of optimism that Democrats would be able to pull this off. Here's what the president had to say yesterday. I've not seen any evidence that whether or not I am doing well or poorly, whether or not I've got my agenda passed or not, is going to have any real impact on winning or losing. Even if we had passed my agenda, I wouldn't claim we won because Biden's agenda passed. But, you know, a lot of White House officials do think, and Democratic strategists do think, that, that having that big, ambitious spending plan passed would have helped, would have given the, uh, the gubernatorial candidates something to run on. And they are certainly hoping that by 2022, they've got something passed. So all those Democrats in the House who are up for re-election will have something to run on there. All right. Shannon right. Pettypiece, thank you so much. Now to what could be one of the most consequential Supreme Court decisions on gun rights in almost 15 years. Yeah, today the country's highest court will hear a case that could determine whether the Constitution guarantees the right for New Yorkers to carry firearms in public. Here to break down what's at stake is NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos. Danny, good morning to you. So this all centers around an NRA challenge to a century-old New York State law. So tell us, what does that law say and what impact could the decision in this case have nationwide. This is about uh, the Second Amendment, of course, and issuing gun concealed carry permits. And the majority of states have what are called shall issue systems, where as long as you can show the prerequisites, 
uh, the license shall issue. But a minority of states, however, the most populous states, I should add, have what is called a proper cause system. In other words, uh, once you satisfy the requirements, you also have to show proper cause, a reason uh, for wanting a concealed carry permit. And that reason, of course, uh, challengers argue, is subject to discretion. And any time you have local government discretion that is unreviewable, you have a system of abuse. And that infringes, say the challengers, on a fundamental constitutional right, the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. But the problem is, unlike other rights and other kinds of laws, uh, this, the Second Amendment has barely, barely been touched by the Supreme Court in the last 20 years. Yeah, so, Danny, that's exactly what I want to ask you about. I mean, they've been reluctant to take up cases involving gun rights. Why are they taking up this one? Because this one, they may not even have to address the fundamental issue of the Second Amendment itself. Instead, really what they're going to be looking at, I predict, is the standard of review for cases like this. In fact, don't be surprised if the Supreme Court kicks this back down to the lower court uh, with an order or a directive to use a particular standard of review. And standards of review, they're not sexy, they're not exciting, they can be a little boring. But the bottom line is this. The question is, does the Supreme Court take a state law like New York's and essentially rubber stamp it, saying, hey, New York, you're allowed to choose to do what you want with firearms. Or instead, do they uh, do they apply what's called a heightened scrutiny? Do they say, well, because the Second Amendment is so sacrosanct, uh, as we do with other constitutional rights, we apply strict scrutiny. And when you do that, almost always the state court, their state law gets struck down. So with a 6-3 conservative majority on the court, do we have any reason to think this ruling could play out along ideological lines? Not so fast, my friend, because even among the Republican bloc, the Republic or the conservative majority on the Supreme Court, there is dissension within the ranks. Consider Amy Coney Barrett, for example. She wrote in a recent dissent when she was on the Seventh Circuit uh, that uh, that gun rights like this uh, should be that felon disenfranchisement laws. If you're convicted of a felony, you can't uh, own a firearm. That seems to be pretty universal. She argued that, wait a minute. We shouldn't have felon disenfranchisement for all felons, only people who are dangerous. So that right there reflects a, a rather unique view of gun ownership among the conservative bloc. So really, it's anyone's call how the Supreme Court will handle this. All right, Danny Savalos, as always, thanks so much. Time to take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. Matt Bodner is with us today from Moscow. Hey, Matt, good morning. Savannah, Joe, good morning. We'll start this one off today in Ethiopia, where the federal government has declared a state of emergency as rebel forces from the northern region of Tigray continue their advance towards the capital. There are reports that several Ethiopian army units have collapsed or otherwise retreated in the face of this advance, and the government is now calling on citizens to take up arms to defend the capital. So definitely a story to keep an eye on. Moving on now to Australia, where police rescued a four-year-old girl who disappeared from a family camping trip about two weeks ago. The case has gripped the nation, and the girl was found during a police raid on a suburban house earlier today. The raid actually took place uh, late at night, local time in the coastal town of Carnarvon, after the police received a tip-off. A 36-year-old man was arrested. And finally, we have some sports news. A 97-year-old Ukrainian by the name of Leonid Stanislavsky officially the Guinness record holder for world's oldest tennis player, squared off against Rafael Nadal. Nadal, of course, is a 20-time Grand Slam champion. Stanislavski first started playing the game around age 30, which he notes is pretty old for tennis, but he insists it's a game that can be played for life. Nadal, for the record, is 35. People have been lining up at the San Diego Botanic Garden to see a rare flower and, most importantly, to smell it. The Titan Arum plant flowered on Halloween for the first time since 2018, and appropriately enough, the scent is so bad, the flower is nicknamed the corpse plant. Flower only gives off the smell when it's blooming, which started Sunday afternoon and only lasts for 48 hours. More than 5,000 people visited the Southern California Garden by Tuesday afternoon to smell the putrid odor for themselves, because who wouldn't want to do that? I know. It's, it's like those people who are like, oh, this tastes awful. Try it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, Get in line. Smell it. <laughs> right. Well, thank so. you. <laughs> I mean, it's wild looking, you know? It's kind of cool. But, exactly. Yeah. All right. It's a, one of those things you just got to try. <laughs> yeah. Time for a weekly checkup.
NBC News senior medical correspondent Dr. John Torres joins us to discuss the latest health headlines you may have missed. One of our favorite segments. Good morning, Dr. Torres. So I want to start with some news. This is what we just teased about a blood test that can spot more than 50 types of cancer, and many of them are actually hard to detect early. Dr. Torres, what more can you tell us about this and how important of a development this could be? And Savannah, this falls under the future is now category. These things that we've mm. been hoping for are now coming to fruition. And this is one of them. It's called the Galeri blood test. It's what we call a liquid biopsy. And by a simple blood test, people are able to find out if they are at higher risk or suspicion for certain types of cancers. Now, this is still trying to seek FDA approval, but it's available by prescription only at this point. It costs a little under $1,000. But what it can do is detect a high number of cancers through that simple blood test by using a DNA signature that those cancers put out. Now, what a lot of experts are saying, and I agree with them, this is not a substitute for regular screenings because you want to make sure that you catch these things early before they get to the cancerous stage, but it certainly is a step in the direction of getting us these tools that can flatten that cancer curve, that cancer mortality curve that we've been looking for for decades, Savannah. Wow. Let's, let's talk a little bit about diet here. A study out of NYU shows us that a higher availability of fast food may be doing more than adding extra pounds. What more can you tell us about this, Dr. Torres? You know, this is interesting because they actually looked at a few different things, and one of them is looking at the VA members themselves, 4 million VA members, because it's a great healthcare system to look at things. And they found that when they lived near fast food restaurants, they were more likely to eat that fast food, and they were more likely to have an increased risk of diabetes because of that weight gain. And so what they're saying is, you know, a couple things. One, the food labels encourage lower calorie items, encourage you to eat lower. And a second study actually showed that those food labels, even though they didn't change change what restaurants were doing with their old food. When they introduced new food, they lowered their calories. So both realizing that if you live near fast food, these are the doctor's orders. If you live near the fast food, then you want to make sure that you understand that and you're making good choices. So don't let those unhealthy food options tempt you. And if you do eat out, check the labels, because more than likely, those labels are going to start changing since they've started to implement calories on those labels. So just look for those lower calorie items and look for things you can substitute. That first one is easier said than done. Don't let unhealthy <laughs> options tempt you. Guilty. Um, all right, <laughs> doctor, something a little reminder for people coming up this weekend. Our clocks will fall back. These two morning show anchors are certainly happy about the extra hour of sleep. But I want to ask you about sleep in general for kids. We should make sure kids are getting enough sleep to control their weight. Why is getting more sleep so important and how does it impact something like that, Dr. Torres? And Savannah, that's one of the big things we found out, that sleep really impacts our health. And part of the way we think it does is because it actually impacts the choices we make the next day. Our defenses go down, and so those sweets, those high-calorie items look really good. But what they found in the study is longer sleep duration was linked with a lower BMI in children. And it didn't matter what time they went to bed. What mattered is how long they slept. And so, obviously, if children have to wake up at a certain time to go to school, then getting them to go to bed early is the ideal thing here. On top of that, remember, Remember, this Saturday, Sunday morning, daylight savings time, so you want to make sure you drop that clock back. But even getting an extra hour of sleep could cause some problems. So first thing, doctor's orders, try to, help, help, try to have those healthy snacks on Monday, because Monday is the day that those daylight savings time changes seem to affect us the most. And even with that extra hour, you're still going to feel a little bit sleepy. We think that that hour actually benefits us. It doesn't. It throws off our mm. circadian rhythms. So you want to be careful. And the honesty of it is, most of us cheat Saturday night anyway, and we go, I got an extra hour. Might as well stay up an extra hour and watch a little more Netflix. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, it is true. And I guess I'm not excited anymore. <laughs> right, right. I thought, yay. My circadian rhythms. Yeah, I guess I'm going to be all messed now, up. So. <laughs> yeah. all, right. all right. Dr. Torres, always great to see you. Thank you so much. As we've been hearing from this week's UN summit in Scotland, climate change is a problem for the whole world, but it's not one that affects every community equally. That's right. Low-income communities will feel the most impact, according to a 2018 U.S. federal report. In urban areas, poorer people are often exposed to more environmental hazards, like living near pollution sites and in housing developments with bad insulation. The report also found that low-income groups, quote, typically have less information, resources, institutions, and other factors to prepare for and avoid the health risks of climate change. Joining us now to discuss is Dr. Radley Horton. He's a climate scientist and the Lamont Research Professor at Columbia University. We also have Yumika Rushing. She's the Chief Strategy Officer 
the NAACP. So, Dr. Horton, we'll start with you. There's actually a lot of tangible impact of climate change around us, especially, mm -hmm. as we've said, in low-income communities. It's not the sort of things we might think of. What are some other examples? Yeah, so four quick components. Who is most exposed to these climate hazards? People living in urban heat islands where the temperatures are literally warmer, regions that are more prone to flooding areas that historically experienced storm surge along the coast or inland rainfall. Element two, when an actual event happens, which communities are most vulnerable, who has the most pre-existing health conditions, who's also experiencing bad air quality. Third, when an event happens, who has the ability to get away, that second home to go to, um, mm. those resources. And fourth, what we call adaptive capacity, who can bounce back after the event happens. Vulnerable communities tend to suffer in all four of those dimensions. Let's give a specific example here. People in the Northeast will likely remember in September when we had that massive flooding after Hurricane Ida. Well, nearly all of the 11 people who died were of Asian descent and also living in basement apartments. Yumika, I'm wondering, what do you think that tells us about climate change and how it can intersect with other issues? Well, clearly, it's a devastating uh, event, but it's not one that we haven't seen before. And so what it tells us is there's really a lack of political will. We've got to put more resources in the right places. It's not often whether these events will happen. It's when. Mm. Uh, and we've got to get the right resources behind us so that we can support these families and we can support communities to have their own interventions and solutions. Let's look outside of the U.S., Dr. Horton. Many developing nations are more vulnerable to climate change. At the COP26 summit, India's prime minister called on richer nations to pledge more money. So why are poorer countries at more risk, and how could these types of investments help out? Yeah, very high population densities in deltas, for example, Western Africa, Southeast Asia is just one example, and those higher temperatures and higher humidity I mentioned. Broader context who's been responsible for most of the emissions historically. It's the developed countries. Those greenhouse gases emitted 50 years ago in Europe and the U.S., still in the atmosphere today, still causing warming. So that's part of this injustice. And of course, the West enriched ourselves economically from those emissions. So there is a real moral responsibility here for the U.S. to do more and Europe to do more to reduce emissions and to invest in adaptation funds to reduce that vulnerability and help prepare for the extreme events that unfortunately can't be avoided in much of the world. And now when these extreme events happen, another aspect of this is that poorer communities, when they're hit by a natural disaster, it often takes them longer to recover. Yumika, that's true in the U.S. and globally. I'm wondering what that means in terms of climate change contributing to this cycle of poverty. That's absolutely right. Um, vulnerability is huge here, and it's one of the reasons the NACP is at the COP conference. We've got to have the right people at the table, communities who are impacted need a voice in these matters and in these negotiations, and they've got to have an opportunity to really advance their own solutions and interventions. They're the most impacted, and they know what's best for their communities. All right. Dr. Horton, Yumika Rushing, thank you both so much for chatting with us about this important mm -hmm. topic that's making so many headlines this week. Thank, thank you. you. Having us. Now it's time for our CNBC Money Minute, the biggest financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Sabana Hanau is with us this morning. Sabana, good morning. Good morning, guys. Union workers at John Deere will remain on strike after they rejected a new contract offer that would have given them a 10 percent raise. The raises in this offer were twice as big as those in the original contract the UAW rejected last month. The disputed contract covers more than 10,000 workers at 12 deer plants in Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas. This is the first major strike at the maker of tractors and farm equipment since 1986. Your grocery bill is about to get a bit higher. Mondelez, the maker of Oreos, Ritz crackers, and other snacks, expects to raise prices by about 7% next year, and that's to offset rising commodity and transportation costs, and as wages grow and demand remains strong. The company's CEO says so far, consumers have been willing to pay more for products because they're still spending less on eating and drinking at restaurants. And the holiday season has officially kicked off as Starbucks unveils its annual menu of festive drinks and cups. 
Starting tomorrow, four new cup designs will be available in stores in red, white, green, and new this year, lilac. Each cup has a gift tag box so you can write a message on it. Fan favorite holiday drinks are also returning, including peppermint mocha and Irish cream cold brew. A new item this year, iced sugar cookie almond milk latte, which is Starbucks' first ever non-dairy holiday drink. Guys, oh. back to you. The Netflix universe is expanding this morning. In addition to watching shows and movies, users can now also play video games. Yeah, in a tweet, Netflix announced its first five games. There they are. They're now available for subscribers to play. As you can see, it includes two based on the hit show Stranger Things. NBC News youth and internet culture reporter Callan Rosenblatt joins us now. Callan, good morning. So tell us about these games and what the streaming giant is saying about its move into mobile gaming. Yeah, so Netflix is now in the gaming game. You will be able to play <laughs> five mobile games on Netflix now. There's no need to download anything new. There's not gonna be an additional fee. It's gonna be right on the platform. So users can open their Netflix app and they can play one of these five mobile games. Now, as you said, two of them are gonna be based on Stranger Things. The others are just going to be fun games for you to play, but it is a interesting move to see a streaming service get into Gaming. Now, they've hired a, a development studio. They've actually acquired a development studio called Night School Studios. They actually are the makers of one of my favorite games, Oxenfree. So I'm really excited to see where they're going to go with yeah. this. Right now, the games are only available on Android, so I don't, can't get my hands on them yet. I only have an iPhone. <laughs> so they said that soon they'll be making games for iPhone as well, and we'll be able to get our hands on them too. Yeah, so I guess that's the question is sort of what's next? Are other streaming services like HBO Max, Disney Plus considering getting into this too? I haven't seen anyone announce that they are also developing games yet, although maybe they are, they are starting to look at this. I think what's really going to depend on is it successful for Netflix. If you remember that they did a uh, sort of interactive uh, movie with Black Mirror, and that had a lot of buzz. And so I think it's really going to depend on whether or not we see this be a really successful venture for Netflix. I think that will determine whether other streaming services want to get into this game as well. Yeah, so what is the streamer, is Netflix actually itself saying about its future plans? You mentioned it's only available on Android. I also only have iPhones. I mean, what's this gonna mean? When do you think we could see it rolling out in other places? I haven't seen a date yet. All they're saying right now is soon. But it seems like they're really eager to sort of get into this facet. As we know, gaming is huge. Uh, Amazon has Twitch. There are uh, lots of films that are based on games. I think it's kind of a perfect marriage. As I said, they acquired a development studio. So it's clear that they have major plans in the future to make this a big facet of their platform. But I think we're going to have to wait and see, especially waiting for it to come out on iPhone so you and I can get our hands on it too. <laughs> any word? Are the games any good? Or is this just like... Pong. Like, what's... <laughs> they just came out, and again, like I wish that I could play them to tell you, are these any good yet? But I think, again, I'm just going to have to wait and see till I can get my hands on them. I'm really excited to get to play them, though. The theme of, you know, incorporating shows that people really yeah, like from Netflix idea. is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. All right, Callan Rosenblatt, yes. thank you so much. Can't wait for Squid Game. <laughs> oh, gosh, I don't know that we need that. <laughs> All right. The holiday season is almost here, or if you're Savannah, your home should be fully decorated by now. And this year's catchphrase is, buy now, pay later, or for those who love a good acronym, BNPL. <laughs> Nearly every online retailer is giving you the chance to pay off your shopping cart in a few installments. Did you know that one? BNP. I didn't know it was a preview. Me either. All right, but does this affect your credit score and what happens if you miss a payment? NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn takes us through how it actually works and what you need to look out for. With an estimated 81% of Americans planning to shop online this holiday, get ready for a new choice at checkout, an offer to buy now and pay later, or BNPL. I use it for everything. Oh, it definitely makes spending in a moment easier. Dozens of retailers now offer BNPL plans. Think of it as a short-term loan that's usually payable in four equal installments. The first payment at the time of checkout, followed by three more, usually every two weeks. It's a short-term, interest-free loan that lets shoppers buy more without having to pay all at once. It's been a great experience for me. It lets me get things that otherwise I couldn't afford to get. That's instant gratification. You want it, you got it. Whether you can afford it now or not, you'll figure it out later. Let me give you an example. Here's a pair of earbuds on sale at Best Buy for $199. When I go to checkout and choose the PayPal option, 
there it is, the pay in for buy now, pay later option. It tells me there's four interest-free payments of $49.75 that will be due every two weeks starting the day I buy them. Or here at Macy's, check out this holiday party dress. It's selling for $1.65. I don't even have to add it to my cart. Right there, it tells me I can get the dress for four interest-free payments of $41.25 with Klarna. But the most important part, you want to read the fine print. So always click on learn more and look at the terms and conditions. It's really, really important that you understand what you're getting into before you sign up. Matt Schultz is the chief credit analyst with LendingTree. Why is buy now, pay later so appealing to consumers right now? It can be interest free and you know how much each payment is going to be and you know how long it's going to take to pay it off. But remember, not all buy now, pay later plans are interest free. Some have terms that stretch from three to 24 months with interest rates as high as 30%. And what happens if you miss a payment? Well, with the pay in four loans, it can really vary. Schultz says because these plans are relatively new, each one has different terms and conditions. He says consider buy now, pay later if you have a steady paycheck. You know you can pay each installment in full by the due date. You have an emergency fund to cover a payment if something happens to your job. But watch out, if you miss a payment, you could face late fees, have your spending limit reduced or get banned by that lender or be reported to the credit agencies. Experts say follow the rules and these buy now, pay later plans are a short term loan option that can help savvy shoppers get what they need this holiday without sending them into debt. Thanks to Vicki Wynn for that. Now, most of these buy now, pay later plans run credit checks before approving your purchase, but they say it's a soft check, so it won't affect your credit score negatively. And actually, in a lot of cases, if you make all your payments on time, a buy now, buy, a buy now pay later plan can have a positive impact on your credit score. Just to be NPL. Exactly. <laughs> I'm not going to remember that. I know. I had to can't, just clearly can't say it either, so. it in, my, in myself, yeah. you know. It's an whatever. option for people to just make sure they don't get it over their head and make sure they can pay it. No, it's actually pretty cool, especially yeah. since there's no interest on it. Yeah. And, and that little and fact most, that. Check, yeah, check most. Especially the fact that it can potentially positively impact your credit source. If you pay it off. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. There All right. you go. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.